Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Book Club. Today, I'll be giving my commentary on Chapter 10 of Becoming Sister Wives on Janelle. Janelle writes, The beauty of living in a polygamous family is that we truly get to embody the principle that it takes a village to raise a child. Our family is that village. While all of our children have benefited greatly from the different personalities of the five adults who have raised them, it wasn't always easy establishing the rules and guidelines for child rearing. When you have four adults, and now five, who grew up differently with different freedoms and different household rules, coming to a consensus about what we should tolerate and what we should permit wasn't easy. The first thing that I think reading that is imagine if Robin was involved in that process of deciding how they wanted to raise the kids early on. It would have made it even more difficult considering how much her parenting style differs from the rest of the moms in the Brown family. When Logan was the only child, there was conflict over the rules that they would set for the children, particularly when it came to how the children would behave in the home. All the adults agreed on the bigger issues, like for example, everyone agreed not to tolerate disrespect or disobedience from the kids. But the smaller stuff was harder to figure out among the adults. Some of the adults didn't want Logan climbing on the couches or playing with the pots and pans in the cupboards. Which of the adults didn't want Logan jumping on couches or playing with pots and pans? Could it maybe possibly be Mary? Logan was adventurous and he enjoyed doing these things. So Janelle allowed Logan to climb and crawl as he liked. Janelle wanted Logan to explore as much as he liked, provided he was not in harm's way. Some adults in the family didn't agree with this, and it led to a lot of friction in the first two years, as Logan learned to walk and crawl. Janelle admits they were overprotective with their first child, but things mellowed as more kids came into the family. Eventually, Janelle's sister wives realized that kids needed to be kids. As the family evolved, each wife created their own household within the family space. So each wife had autonomy in their area and that increased over the years, of course. Each wife raised her child just as they wanted according to her own preferences. When a child visits another mom's place, they know what the rules are for that mom in that space and they abide by her rules. Janelle gives the example of how in Mary's house, the kids know they can't roughhouse to the degree that they do at her place or even Christine's. Even with the difference in the houses, the adults still have to manage to come to a consensus on the bigger issues, and all of the adults agree on what they classify as disrespect. If a child of any wife in the family behaves in a way that is disobedient, harmful, or rude, any one of the moms is permitted within their rights to correct that behavior through scolding the child. Janelle feels that any transgression that requires more than a scolding is something for that child's mother and Cody to handle. If there is an issue with a kid, Janelle typically alerts the child's mom that she observed a problem and she will leave it to that mom to handle the situation. The downside for the kids is there is always a parent watching, especially for the teenagers. The adults joke with the kids that they always have eyes and ears everywhere because with five adults, they often do. Janelle gives the example of running errands one day when she saw one of the brown kids walking in the street a distance from home and Janelle knew that this teenager was supposed to be somewhere else because all of the parents communicated a lot. So Janelle called this teen's mom, her sister wife, to confirm that it was fine for this teen to be where they were instead. And Janelle says if it was not fine with the mom, the kid would have had to take accountability. It's great that the sister wives teach their kids to be accountable for their behavior and for their choices. There seems to be a stress on upholding accountability for the brown kids. And Cody even mentions in an episode 
that he wants his kids to be accountable for their choices. They have to be accountable for the choices they make, and he wants them to own their choices. But Cody seems to have a really hard time himself with accountability and with owning his choices. Let's remember that he reminds his wives constantly when they gripe and moan about their emotional suffering, inconveniencing him. Cody doesn't validate his wives or try and understand their feelings or try and see what he can do to make it easier on them, to make it less devastating for them. Cody isn't there as a husband. Instead, Cody says he doesn't want to put himself in his wife's shoes. He doesn't want to even try to think about their emotions because then he'd feel like he was doing something wrong or unfair. He tries not to think about his wife's emotions. That's the message he communicated at Mary's 20th wedding anniversary. And what he tells his wives when they bitch and moan inconveniencing him, probably because he assumes they're PMSing and irrational during that time, rather than assuming that perhaps they're behaving this way because of his behavior. What does Cody tell his wives? Let's remember, he says what? You signed up for this. You agreed to this. I think it's time for Buttercup to suck it up. He signed up for this too. He agreed to this too. He married four women, vowing to each one that he could handle this, that he wanted to do this, that he could do this, that he could handle to have a tribe of kids and balance the demands of being a husband to four women and a father to all of these kids. He married these women, deceiving them, and instead of taking accountability for the choice he made, instead of owning his choice like he wants his kids to, Cody instead says things like, my family are an obstacle to my goals in life. Cody may not be accountable, but it's great that his wives are instilling accountability in their kids. The wives know what it's like to live with a man who takes none. It was easier to cross discipline the kids when they were younger. Rules for behavior were more cut and dry back then when the transgressions were lying or fighting. But as the kids grew into teenagers, it became more difficult to intervene with the way in which one of Janelle's sister wives manages things. Which sister wife is Janelle talking about? Janelle halfway spilled the tea. It's up in the air, but it hasn't hit the carpet yet. Is she referring to Mary or Robin? We know most likely it's not Christine. Mary is very particular, and we know she had an issue with how Leo was disciplined once in the past. So it could be Mary that Janelle is hesitant to attempt to discipline like, or it could be Robin because Robin has a parenting style that is the polar opposite style to Christine, Janelle, and Mary. I think it's Robin more so she is referring to as the wife, whose kids it became more difficult to intervene with, with the way that that sister wife manages things. But it could be Mary. I don't know. Who do you guys think Janelle is referring to? There's a bigger gray area now regarding what constitutes a transgression. Janelle explains that the older kids each have their own personalities, so what one child might do to be cheeky, another child might do in good fun. One household might have different views about phones, curfews, or TV. There are different rules. All the moms have strong relationships with all the teens in the family and their own teens as well. Teenagers are more complicated, so each mom sets their own rules and boundaries because she knows her kids best. The universal rules always apply. Like, for example, none of the adults tolerate blatant disrespect or lying from the kids in the family. If lying or disrespect comes from a kid, Janelle feels more than comfortable to step in. Janelle will also intervene if a child ignores their mother's instructions. She has no problem stepping in as a secondary enforcer so the child knows their mother is to be taken seriously. Sometimes all the adults get after one kid and that kid knows it's time to shape up. 
I think just as a viewer, in my opinion, that in this dynamic where each kid has five parents rather than just two, and all of the parents could potentially gang up on the child, on a problem child, especially when they were all living in the same house, that could create a lot of resentment for the child especially with the different rules in the different households. And I understand the adults in the family tried to work as a cohesive unit with the universal rules. And I know certain things like disrespect or lying were black and white issues in the family, but I think things could easily get sticky and it could create resentment with the child from the child to the parents to have to deal with all those extra voices and opinions and criticisms. The child might feel ganged up on or like everyone is against them, if that's the case. We learn that Janelle is the softy in the bunch. Janelle's older kids often tease her because she usually doesn't enforce the punishments she threatens them with. Janelle feels more comfortable discussing her kids' behavior with them and what they did wrong rather than punishing them for their behavior. I think that makes the most sense and it fosters a relationship where the child will have a lot of respect for their parents. And later on, as they grow up, they're going to appreciate their parent more and the parenting style more rather than resenting their parents for just resorting to the easy way or the lazy way and directly using punishment. Janelle says she has always been non-confrontational, so that's also her parenting style. She says if it wasn't for Cody and her sister wives, her kids would have run wild. The other adults in the family are quicker to execute their punishments and rarely let bad behavior slide. And Janelle credits the way her kids turned out to the fact that Cody, Mary, and Christine backed up her parenting decisions. They provided a structured environment for her kids and they weren't afraid to enforce things. When they all lived in one house in Utah in the separate living spaces, they all managed their own separate households except for the mortgage. The Browns discovered long ago that financial autonomy was important, but the wives still often pass money back and forth between wives to help cover expenses. So they all contribute with the day-to-day stuff like a wedding gift or baby shower gift And they also all contribute to the larger family expenses, like the cell phone bill, for example. When the family was younger, Christine and Janelle worked together and they helped each other financially. They supported each other by helping each other with meals and errands. When they lived in the Lehigh house, Christine and Janelle did most of the food shopping and the household shopping. When Janelle worked, Christine would cook dinner for her kids along with Janelle's. And when Janelle didn't work, she would cook for her kids. Even when Janelle cooks and stocks her fridge, she finds that her kids still scavenge at other mom's houses because another mother's food is usually more enticing. The kids in the family are free to move from house to house. That was much easier to do in Utah when they all lived in one big house. In Vegas, the kids have to walk, drive, or be driven back and forth. On some weekend nights, Janelle's house is unusually quiet because all the kids are usually at another mom's house hanging out. And over the summer, Janelle's pool was pretty popular with the older kids, but some of the younger brown children enjoyed sleepovers at Goblins. During the school year, the most popular houses are Christine and Robin's for the kids because they're the easiest homes for the kids to meet up at and there are always lots of kids in that neighborhood as well. There are certain kids in the family who form attachments with one of their other moms. Janelle says these special bonds can be temporary or lifetime bonds with another mother. These bonds can be a temporary solution to something a child is going through during a particular time in their life. Janelle gives the example of Hunter gravitating towards Christine. She says, Christine has a way of talking to Hunter, and she can be more helpful to Hunter than Janelle at this time in his life, and Janelle is very grateful to Christine for that. 
I believe what Janelle is referencing is Hunter's deep depression that he suffered upon moving to Vegas from Utah. Hunter was withdrawn and he just hung out in his room without wanting to engage in life very much. He was sad, he was traumatized by the move. And during this time, the teens had a pool party and Hunter didn't want to join in. Instead, he stayed in his room playing video games, which is understandable. If you're sad, you're not going to feel like being social. Janelle said she didn't know why Hunter didn't want to participate in the pool party. Hunter was sad. Hunter was grieving the life that he knew. And Hunter possibly had trouble fitting into the new social system in Vegas. A move is very traumatic and stressful on a child. Your school and your social system is like the only life you have outside of your home, basically. And I know because as a kid, I had to move every three or four years. So I always had to be the new kid and to reestablish friends, only to move again and do it all over again. It's not just easy and simple. And Hunter was a star athlete. He was popular in Utah. And he moved to a place that was the polar opposite of the social system and the place that he lived in Utah. So it was a lot for him, understandably, and a lot changed for him with that move. So Hunter went over to Christine's house during that party. He just wanted peace and quiet. He just wanted to hang out with baby Truly. And Christine accommodated Hunter. She was loving and kind and compassionate. She allowed Hunter to just be. She didn't pester him about his mood or his depression. She didn't pressure him to participate or be social. She just allowed Hunter to be. And Hunter fed baby Truly and he held her and he entertained her. And Christine mentioned this was the cheapest and the best therapy. So that's a beautiful example of a bond a child can form with another mother. Janelle is glad that her sister wives and Cody are there to help Janelle navigate adolescence and issues of love and sexuality for the older kids. The most important lesson Janelle teaches her kids is not to get too serious too fast. The adults in the Brown family back Janelle and they help her to emphasize the point to the older kids that serious dating is not appropriate in high school. If the older kids want to date, the Browns prefer they go on group dates. With Maddie, Logan, and Hunter, Janelle is clear about the pitfalls of too much intimacy before they're old enough to handle it. Janelle warns the teens that unexpected babies and STDs could ruin their lives forever. And the kids roll their eyes, but Janelle says she has four other adults to back her up who also share her vision of morality and who make sure her teens are careful. I understand preaching abstinence and saying no, serious dating aloud. I understand idealism and morality. No parent wants their teenager getting their heart broken or dating seriously or engaging in sex or intimacy or risking getting STDs or having an unplanned pregnancy. But teenagers will also find ways to do what they want. And once their heart is involved and their hormones are involved, there is no telling what will happen regardless of how many times a parent has these talks or steps on their soapbox. It's also good to teach your kids if despite my advice, you happen to cross a line, use protection, go on birth control, educate your kids about protection, about being careful, about how to be safe. Teach your teenagers about STDs and what precautions can be taken to prevent babies and to prevent STDs because there is a chance no matter how much you preach, your teen will still end up going on dates or engaging in intimacy. So it's also better to be safe than sorry. It's better to also educate your teens on how to protect themselves if they do cross a line. You have to be realistic that your older teens will date. Your older teens will possibly engage in things you wish they would hold off on. So you should always advise, you should always have these talks, but you should also educate on how these teens should be protecting themselves just in case, in my opinion. Janelle writes, despite the complexity of my relationships with my sister wives, the support network that we have is unbeatable. 
in the ideal world, we would all be able to be together as a family as much as possible. But with so many kids running off in so many directions, this is not always possible. I wish that I could attend more school functions than I'm able to, but we have to come up with a divide and conquer system. While not every mother can attend every event, no child will ever have a recital, game, play, or graduation without a few members of the family present. So if I can't make it on game day, I know at least one of my sister wives will be there. That is the beauty of our family, especially now that we are able to live out in the open. We can be there for one another without question and without scrutiny. We can finally be the family we always dreamed of being. Even last season, Janelle said she has come to the conclusion that after her kids are all gone, she wants her community and her support system to be the five adults in the Brown family. That's how she envisions her life with the five adults by her side, enjoying the family as the kids marry and have kids and build lives as they have been. But now we know the Browns can't finally become the family they always dreamed of being. Cody complains his family are an obstacle to his goals in life. Mary and Cody no longer have any type of relationship. Christine has left the family. Janelle's relationship with Cody is rocky, and I think Cody is going to try systematically push Janelle out next, just as he did successfully with Christine and unsuccessfully with Mary. And so all that's left standing really is Cody and Robin, and we'll see what happens, but we do know that Janelle and Christine are very close, and their kids are very close as well even after Christine leaving. So maybe Christine and Janelle will remain as sisters and they will create a little branch of what once was. As Cody and Robin live in their mansion, miserably deflecting, weighed down with anxiety for the rest of their lives, as Christine lives her best life and Janelle becomes the happy, peaceful, idealistic, hippie woman she wants to be with the gray hair and the long skirts and the greenhouses and the peace of mind. I don't think Janelle needs Cody. She has left him before. She is more than capable of living without Cody. Her world does not revolve around him and she doesn't need him around. She doesn't rely on attention from Cody to feel secure and stable. She doesn't care. And I think Cody and Janelle are on different pages about how they see their relationship. Last tell all, we discovered that Cody doesn't love Janelle. When asked by the host if he was in love with Janelle, he deflected. He didn't answer the question. He said, ask her. She will tell you she's not in love with me. And the host mentioned Cody and Janelle were so in sync. And Cody disabused her of that notion by clarifying they aren't in sync with each other. They aren't in tune with each other. And when the host asked Janelle about her relationship with Cody, she said Cody was her best friend and that Cody is a great dad, even though the older kids all don't talk to Cody. So we will see where the relationship goes with Janelle, but my hunch is Cody will use the same strategy he used on Mary and Christine to try and push Janelle to leave him. He did this with Mary, he did it with Christine, and we know last season Janelle had to do a lot of deep soul searching to decide if she still wanted this to live polygamy to be with Cody. So I think Cody's behavior will determine if Janelle will stick around. But I guarantee if Cody is a dick to Janelle and if he tries to manipulate her, she will not take it. I doubt she will. Judging from Cody's behavior in the season 17 trailer, Cody's behavior and mental well-being only devolve further in the upcoming season. So it's going to be interesting to see how that affects the dynamics with Janelle that are already strained. If Janelle treats Cody as her best friend and Cody treats her as an adversary who is on a different team, he will lose Janelle and maybe he wants that. We don't know if Cody still adheres to his faith or not. That's his personal business. But we know last tell all he had doubts. And we know that in Cody's faith, if he does adhere to it to some degree, that he cannot divorce his wives. 
but his wives can leave him if they so choose. And so I think Cody is tired of these marriages he sees as obligations, and he is tired of going through the motions of pretending to care. Cody says his family is an obstacle to his goals in life. So what are his goals if his goals aren't his family? What are his goals? What is more important to Cody than his family? In my opinion, his goal is to live monogamy with Robin and overcome the obstacle of his family by pushing his wives to leave him with his toxic behavior. That does it for this episode. To my YouTube viewers, please like and subscribe and let me know your thoughts in the comments section if you like. I'll be back later this week for the next episode of my Sister Wives Rewatch, Season 16, Episode 5, Sad, Sorry, Lonely Little People. Thanks for listening. See you soon. Bye.